Hi folks, we have started in just a couple of minutes.
Hello and uh, welcome to Virginia Stage Company at the Wells Theater. My name is Patrick Mullins. I'm uh, the director of public works and uh, producer here at the um, theater. And uh, we're really glad to have you on our ghost tour. It looks so nice outside tonight. It's just getting dusk. I think the brightness is a little misleading. Um, but we're here at the Wells. This is my friend Ashley Bratton. Hi. Ashley is... Um, owns the Velvet Witch and is an intuitive psychic and is going to be reading the energy of spaces as we go through this through the room. I see a lot of familiar faces from uh, folks that I know as you're popping by and um, feel free to type in some ghost stories you've heard because I know that there's a lot of staff joining us tonight from the past. So we'll, um, we'll be doing this. Uh, I also want to say that um, this is kind of a silly fun thing to do right now and we're really blessed to be able to do it, but I hope that wherever you are, you're taking care of yourself. You'll notice that we are maintaining uh, social distance as we uh, have our tour tonight. We have a couple of folks in the lobby I'll uh, point out. Um, so we have some security and somebody maintaining things. Um, and I know that this is not official um, mask material. However, uh, my allergies can act up and I, uh, in case I break into a sneezing fit in the attic somewhere, I want to make sure that uh, I can cover my face. <laughs> um, and yes, Sylvie, we will cover all the things. Hi in New Zealand. All right, so we're gonna go inside and get a look around. Yeah. If you don't know a lot about the Wells Theater, it was built in 1913 uh, by Jake and Otto Wells, who had about, thir uh, sorry, about 46, I believe, theaters in the Mid-Atlantic and the South. Um, they built a theater in 1912. It opened in 1913. And uh, let's step inside. It's a beautiful space. Beau Arts architecture. Ooh, got it. And uh, you'll see that there are lots of carvings and faces and things all over the space. So Ashley, do you read anything when you just walk into the building? Oh my God. Great, so we're gonna walk on in to the side lobby here. We have a couple of friends hanging out. Uh, this is Maris Smith, our marketing director, and Carolyn Thatcher, our production manager, who are here to help uh, wrangle social media and also for safety reasons, because this is a big building that's been empty for a while. And I wanna introduce you to some friends we're going to carry with us on the tour. Pardon my um, low budget mixing system. But uh, this works. Uh, so we'll start with Ryan Clemens. Ryan, you want to say hi and tell us how you come to this group? Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ryan Clemens. I work with the Virginia Stage Company uh, with our education department. And I have been haunting the wells myself for, mm, gosh, 10, 11 years now. Ryan is a resident theater artist and a longtime performer in shows and has given a lot of ghost tours himself. So he may pop in with some stories at various times. Yeah. Uh, and then Josh Weinstein. Hi, I'm Josh Weinstein. I'm the owner of Norfolk Tour Company. Um, for years before I owned the company, I gave tours of uh, Norfolk cemeteries. I now give tours of um, downtown Norfolk. That includes Freemason. I also do a uh, downtown Norfolk uh, theater history tour that is kind of, um, you know, big picture um, effect of uh, uh, theaters on downtown life over the last century and a half. And uh, I'm here to uh, tell you my favorite uh, Norfolk ghost story when the time comes. That's so, great. Thanks. Evidently, uh, I've uh, shut you off and we're back. <laughs> uh, let's go to jump down to Ryan Ward. Virginia Stage Company from 
2010 to 2015. So we're five seasons, but so my fair share of just oddities or things that weren't, when you see the space every day, it's kind of, you notice changes and things that um, kind of are different around there. So I'm just here to give my two cents about things I saw and things that I experienced my five years there, so. That's great. And Dr. Charles Ford. This is Dr. Charles Ford. I'm a professor of history at Norfolk State. So I've written on local history on Norfolk in the 20th century, uh, red lights and civil rights. Uh, so I'll give a, a little bit of overview of Norfolk right at the time of the Wells founding around 1910, 1912. I'll give uh, sort of an overview of the, the geography and the topography of, of Norfolk at that time. That's great. Thank you. So um, I think we're going to look around the lobby just a second here, and I'm going to take these gentlemen with us in my handy-dandy apron pocket um, because that way they can see. Oh, I should give you front-facing camera. Sorry. There you go. All right. And uh, so we are in the side lobby of the Wells. This was originally a retail space and um, at one time housed a Dumars, uh, the home of the original waffle cone was a shirt shop at one point. It's been re reconfigured twice. Uh, this bar that you're looking at here was put in during the last renovation, and they had added a grand staircase during the first renovation. Originally, when you came into the building, you would have entered through the rotunda, as we were in just a few moments ago. And um, after you came in, you would come directly into the back of the theater. Now... In our time, we have a box office, and this is our, um, this is our uh, kind of landing space, space for receptions. Originally, this wall on your right, however, was not here. They re-sloped the floor during the, during the uh, 80s, is my understanding, during that renovation. And originally, seats would have come all the way back to here. And we'll talk just a little bit more about all of that. I just realized that I've left my flashlight, so I'm gonna grab that. We'll need it later. All right. So we are headed into the house. Are you ready, I, Ashley? I am ready. I am all right, ready. I'm gonna let you lead. Okay, great. So we are entering the house of the Wells Theater. can see the frescoes on the ceiling, the boxes, and on stage. How's it going for you, Ashley? Well, you know, as I said, when I walked in the building, I did feel a lot of energy and walking into here, it's like amplified. Um, heavy. Um, and again, I, I don't want to say in a negative way, but I can absolutely feel, um, and I don't want to necessarily say uh, specific spirits right now, um, but I, I feel just uh, intense, heavy energy in here. And it's, um, but it's, it's beautiful. There's also an underlying uh, bit of peace to it as well. So but it's pretty intense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, uh, <laughs> We're going to walk up on stage, look around just a little bit, we'll talk a little bit more about our fly loft. It's very historic and uh, something we're proud of and also in the process of, of renovating soon and the theater at large. And of course, the ghost light. If you don't know what a ghost light is, it is a light left on in the theater for safety. Um, uh, and uh, we're... It's also kind of a, a metaphor, I think, in this time. Somebody, I think it was John Bremner, said it's never been more appropriate. And uh, the light is on here, and, and we will come back, and we have faith in that. And um, I don't know about you, but for me, the theater's been a, safe of, a place of safety. And uh, I think that, that stands that for that very much. So, um, Ashley, do you want to pull a card? Um, 
I decided to kind of do an energy read um, just based off the cards. I did shuffle already in the lobby uh, before we started. So I have them in my little pocket here with all my crystals as well. And uh, I usually pull intuitively, so the card necessarily on top is not gonna be the one that I pull, but I just wanna kinda see if uh, the cards are in line with how I'm um, feeling from all of this. All right, so it wasn't too far in there. This is my favorite deck. Ah. So um, I pulled the Hermit card and um, it's uh, pretty cool that I pulled this right now because I think this is an overall energy of what's going on, not only in this theater, but uh, as a whole right now. The Her Hermit is all about um, kind of finding uh, inner, inner peace and inner journey. Um, it's about um, staying within um, the walls of your comfort zone and your safe place. And, uh, but also it can be a time to face our shadows. Um, and in darker times um, like this, we are being asked to uh, really uh, dig deep and, and, and go on an inner journey and, so, and face our shadows. And I think that there are quite a few shadows in this building. Um, but there is a lot of peace, obviously, with the art that goes on here. So um, I love this. I think this is perfect. Thank you. I will say, too, that um, in my time, I haven't heard any dark energy stories. Yeah, Mis I mischievous. So. Definitely yeah. mischievous, but, um, but not dark. Um, so here we are. And... I think the first thing we talk about is um, the lady in white. If you're not familiar with the lady in white, she's usually seen up here in the mezzanine, the first mezzanine. You'll remember, of course, this building was built in 1913, so it was a segregated balcony up top. Um, but this second mezzanine um, is where we've most often seen the woman in white, although she, there are stories of her appearing in the building next door. If we look to our right backstage, you can see there's a big door that goes into our shop area. So on the other side of that big uh, door um, is actually the Monroe building. It's the adjoining building that was built out during, and it's right behind this wall as well, behind the hallway here. Um, it was built out as a support building for the Virginia Stage Company. Governor's School of the Arts Drama Program was based there. And then a few years ago, they moved the rest of, um, uh, of a lot of their programs. Most of their programs are housed in that building at this point. Um, save, I believe, Dance, which is down the street at our great friend Todd Rosenliebs. And so um, a lot of the stories don't just happen in the space. We do have a lot of reports from this adjoining building, which has been, which is almost as old as the Wells. Um, originally, if we look up, you can see, and we'll go in later, the dressing rooms, um, and you'll understand better a little bit about how it might have worked in 1913. But we have our dressing rooms next door. And so the woman in white has been seen in those dressing rooms in addition to this mezzanine space. Often uh, people hear someone singing uh, arias, um, a female soprano. And uh, we also attribute that to happening in this space. Uh, or, or attribute that, sorry, to the woman in white. Um, so we're going to take a little trip up to the mezzanine. Before you said that, I totally got um, the energy that she was, uh, she was a playwright here. She was in a, she has been in a performance here. Um, and... I, I didn't even know about the singing until just now, and I felt that very strong. Like she, she is reliving. It's almost like a, what we call residual haunting, um, and I think that that was her actually her favorite seat in the house was that particular balcony. Um, but she also um, really loved. She she just loved it here, the best time of her life. So. Well, maybe I'll uh, spend some time with her later as well because. <laughs> I love it here, and my favorite seats are right there in the front of the mez. It's a beautiful space to watch from. So we're going to head upstairs. Um, here we go into the lobby. How are our friends on uh, Zoom doing? Everybody good? 
Dr. Ford, while we're traveling, can you talk to us a little bit about um, the history of this area during this period? about 67,000 in the census of 1910. And uh, today we're in a city of 250,000. So certainly it was a smaller city in terms of people, but also land area too. Um, Norfolk had just annexed Berkeley across the river, but it really hadn't annexed uh, a large area which would go from Larchmont all the way around to Sewell's Point and uh, to the river, to the Elizabeth River. That area would be annexed in 1923. And then, of course, uh, Norfolk County would be annexed early in 1935. That would be Moorview and Five Points area. So uh, Norfolk was a smaller city. Uh, it, it would double in size in 1920 because of World War I. Uh, so the Wells Theater was built right before World War One. so it was built in that decade of growth for uh, this particular area. Um, it also came at a time of the heyday of white supremacy, you know, that was the 19-teens, and Norfolk, during the Civil War, had been an occupied city, actually had been part of uh, the Union side for most of the war. Uh, it uh, would fall to the Union very early in the war, 19 in 1862, and then uh, become the occupied city. So uh, Portsmouth was always under Confederate control using the war. So Portsmouth and Norfolk were different in that sense. Uh, Norfolk itself, though, uh, became more Confederate <laughs> after the war. Uh, and of course, the Confederate monument would go up downtown uh, right before the Wells would. Uh, so certainly this time, a uh, highly segregated city uh, and increasingly segregated as the 20th century would go on. Uh, also a city that uh, drank a lot. This was the wickedest city in America, according to Carrie Nation, who came here in 18, 1894. And that's still, I think, the case. Uh, the rest of Virginia was very, very dry. Uh, but, uh, of course, you know, the Wells Theater today allows drinks in, and that certainly is in the spirit of uh, Norfolk. Uh, this was before the influx of sailors and everything else, so <laughs> Norfolk would have the, the reputation of being a very, very fun city in that sense. Uh, New Orleans, in some ways, uh, without the charm, maybe, but, you know, certainly, certainly the, the, uh, the drinking uh, would be the, the major thing here, vice to uh, again, servicing sailors, not just for the, the Navy, but also from all over the world. They would have the highest uh, venereal rates uh, in the 20th century from the 19-teens onward to the, you know, to, to today. So, yes. so those, those things are very, very true. It was a fun city in that sense. <laughs> of course, one of the dangers <laughs> associated with these kinds of vices as well as pleasures. Uh, there are many brothels, of course, around the wells uh, in, in the 19th the late 19th century into the 19th So you have uh, you know, a service industry <laughs> of entertainment and fun and, and frivolity, but also um, of poverty too. Uh, North, uh, Norfolk and Virginia would be in the teens and 20s, the poorest, one of the poorest states in the union. Of course, that's not the case today. One of the wealthiest because of government spending, which lifted us out of uh, many depressions of the world wars and, and certainly the, the military and the federal presence here uh, has given us uh, recession proof uh, uh, sort of infrastructure which allows us to withstand a lot of, a lot of uh, economic problems in other places that are but that was not the case in 1913 right <laughs> Um, the irony, of course, that Virginia always prided itself on less government spending, but government spending is what brought it out of um, its uh, poverty. They would have great poverty and have the worst housing, the worst housing in, in America. It had dirt floors and people were living on straw around the wells, you know, around Freemason. East Freemason was the worst, worst housing in America. I mean, no, no running water into the 19-teens, no electric lights. Um, and that's just a few blocks from us, right? Exactly. It's a like really horrible situation. Sure. And, but, but 
time, but it was more sanitation than earlier in time. I mean, in the 1850s, you had the yellow fever epidemic, you had all these epidemics, and it was very unhealthy to be in the Wolf Country, and that's why the peninsula was much more populous during the colonial era. But by 1913, sanitation had improved, so Norfolk was becoming safe enough to live in, in terms of not having these pandemics, at least, you know, we thought. <laughs> right. That's a, that's a good chance for us to uh, explore this mezzanine a little bit more. And Charles, we may come back to you in just a bit. Um, so Ashley, uh, how are you feeling now? I've been standing in here a long time. Um, so again, I, I felt like the mezzanine was the place to be. I felt very much down there um, that there is um, the lady in white. I feel like she was a player here. She was in a play. She didn't die here but um this was really where her heart was and so her her um it's it's a residual haunting she um i'm sure again she stays pretty much in this area and so um this is where when she uh was in the audience she loved to sit she loved to sit and watch the different parts of rehearsal here um but um she's very much a singer and uh i feel like she also almost had a like an operatic uh, style, very um, kind of uh, Christine and uh, Phantom uh, <laughs> vibe. So um, I feel that very much. Maybe she was uh, that role. I don't know, but um, it's it, it's a it's a good energy over here. Uh, definitely, I thought I saw something earlier when uh, Dr. Charles Ford was talking, and I was like, let me not <laughs> let me not scream. <laughs> Um, yeah, I still am human, guys. Like, I'm a little freaked out because I can feel it all. But um, anyway, so, um, but yeah, that's what I get. I, I feel like I can uh, hear her voice over and over again, which is pretty cool. Um, so for those of you have, who I guess have experienced it, um, I'm assuming it, it sounds pretty, like you said, high soprano, maybe kind of operatic-ish. That's what we've heard. Okay. Uh, let me check in right quick. Ryan Ward, do you have anything? And by the way, Jessica Holt, I saw you out there. And, uh, and I, um, I agree. I'm glad that you agree. Th these are the best seats in the house. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Ryan, what you got for us? Anything about the woman in white? Um, I never really experienced her much in that area. But when we had the Monroe building, I really saw her quite a bit. We used to have our costume shop and our prop shop on the third floor. And if, when you come down from like the tech rail and turn all the lights off at the end of the night, if somebody had said off, left some lights on, um, or there's another light or something, the main control for the lights was all the way up. And when I'd have to walk down in the pitch black, late, late nights, I mean, we're talking 11, 12, probably in the evening, um, after everybody had gone home, it was just me and the keys doing my like lock up rounds. Um, occasionally there were some times where it'd be like, you weren't quite alone in that hallway or like, I go in one door and you turn around and then it would sound like the stair door had just shut. So there was always like, I never really saw her like the experience to myself, but I feel like she was always around, if that makes sense. I feel like she doesn't, she's not just here. Um, I feel like she has been present here, but um, I, for some reason, feel like I saw her earlier. Um, before we started, I was standing on the stage and I thought I saw Patrick walk by, uh, he had used, went to use the restroom and it definitely was not him. Um, it was a white uh, figure um, in the lobby. So um, she's definitely, um, she likes to wander. She, she just loves the theater. So um, she's not anything to be afraid of though. She has really good energy. She just loves to sing. I love that. So uh, we've talked a lot about um, the Mez and the woman in white. We're going to leave her for a little bit um, and talk about uh, squeaky boots or squeaky shoes, depending on who tells the story. Um, above us, of course, is the next balcony, and um, we're going to head up there. But I'll tell you a little bit of the story as we go. <laughs> um, I will tell you that this is the part of the tour that scares me the most, although this is the ghost that, um, hey, there you are. This is the ghost that we credit with being um, maybe the kindest of them all. Um, I was trying to reach Jenny before this. She's our resident costume shop manager. 
and uh, she um, left a toy for this particular ghost. You'll remember it was a, uh, a, a, a segregated balcony originally when the theater was built. Whoa, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Hang on, I'm losing. A... Are you guys still there? Are you with me now? Okay. Uh, so we are now upstairs. And I'm going to flip my camera around. And we are in the top balcony. So the story is that uh, a child fell off of the segregated balcony, um, presumably an African-American child. And so we hear squeaky shoes running around. And I mentioned that on the other side of this wall is um, the Monroe building. And we have, whoa, these shadows kind of freak me out. Sorry, guys. <sighs> Um, so, whew. so, um, on, we have, uh, often heard, uh, feet squeaking on the third and fourth floor, especially my office used to be on the third floor and it was not unusual to hear, uh, you think somebody's shoes squeaking down the hallway and stick your head out and there was nobody there. Um, and Jenny, uh, our costume shop manager, I mentioned that during the renovation, we added this wall. You can see there's a wall right here on my right. And that wall uh, uh, divides us from some storage and it's an acoustic thing too because of the resloping of the floor, et cetera. So um, costume storage is up here and Jenny um, can often just think about a costume she wants. And, uh, and when she comes up, it's already at the front of the rack and ready to go. Um, and that happens um, in costume storage, which is just right over here. Um, behind this door. I unlocked it earlier so we could peek in just a little bit and you can see um, Hi costumes. I'm gonna tell you I'm a little scared to go too far in here, but I'm gonna go in just a little bit um, but you can see our beautiful storage and um, But you can see also how these these are still stairs right from the original uh, Seats that used to go all the way up All right, I'm gonna back out of there for now and close the door again. Hi, squeaky boots. How are you feeling, Ashley? Um, this is probably, and an earlier, um, I think I, I didn't mean a dark at all. I meant, you know, kind of lurking in the shadow type. But um, Speak just a little louder for oh, us. I'm sorry. Um, I, earlier I was saying um, I, I didn't want to um, say there's dark energy here. I meant more so like kind of lurking in the shadows type, um, if anybody took it that way. It's absolutely not what I meant, but I will say, as soon as we walked up the stairs, uh, I felt an energy shift, and um, it's it's uh, the spirit is very present here. It is a I can feel that it is a child. Um, I got very strongly that oh god, it's like making me kind of emotional. Um, that his uh, mother used to love to sing to him, so um, of course uh, she sang him to sleep. Um, he uh, loves to engage. He's just very playful. Um, he's, um, and I don't want to say it's a residual thing. I think he um, is stuck here from uh, his unfortunate death, but he um, is, uh, puts a really good energy off, but it is very present, which means, um, would make sense if he is uh, that, has that much energy. Um, he has conjured that, that he can uh, present um, the costumes to the costume designer. That is amazing. Um, and I think you said that she had offered him a toy, correct? Yeah, and yeah, she leaves him toys. Um, he is a very, he, I just feel like that he loved that. He's, um, again, he's very playful and, uh, but there is, um, he, he thinks about his mother singing to him asleep. Um, and I feel that, and again, it makes me a little emotional. Uh, it's very intense energy, but um, it's, it, I could see again why he shows himself often. Um, do you do you think you'd be up to going a little deeper in costume storage? Yeah. Several people are asking, and oh god, yeah. <laughs> okay. Ooh, I'm a little sweaty on that one. All right, hi guys. Oh wow! All right. Um, here we go. Try to get you front facing again. Um, shoe storage. Shoes are very important in the theater. 
I often say that shoes um, do more for a character's psychology and getting a customer that helps you get the right shoes is really important. I'm also talking because I'm scared. <laughs> um, how, how you doing back there? He likes, I feel like, so it's, you guys call him squeaky shoes, right? Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's more like uh, a playing with the shoes, not necessarily his shoes mm -hmm. squeaking. Um, he l likes this area. Ooh. Right? It's crazy. Like, I, I am... <laughs> it's really intense, guys. I get, yeah. Um, I, and he likes to play. Um, he rubs them together and makes them squeak. And that's what you guys hear. It's not necessarily him running. Right. Um, but he does like to... I don't know if anybody's seen him, like, kind of on the rigs out here. That's, I think, he was trying to play. And that's what happened when he fell. To take out my sponge... My that could make sense. Woo! It is a, oh, um, <laughs> so we're, this is all the way up against the back wall of the theater. Um, and it would make sense that this is yeah, a safe space. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to move closer to the door before you ask for a sign, <laughs> but I, I think that's a very valid thing to do, I'm just curious, but it, I feel it, so strong. I feel like no, no, I, I agree. Now you're freaking me out. <laughs> well, I'm freaking myself out. <laughs> um, all right, all right. I'm do right, you want to okay. do you want to ask for a sign? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me uh, give me a second here. Let me um, I'm gonna just hey, this is positive energy here. We um, we know that you're here. If you um feel comfortable enough to show us that you're here, we acknowledge you and um. You would like to know uh, how I feel about us being here. Can you show us a sign? I know you love shoes. If you're here right now, show us a sign. It's okay. You have nothing to be scared of. All right, buddy. We, we're going to have to move on. Yeah, we're moving on. But come play with us sometime, okay? <laughs> you can play know. as long as you want to. <laughs> All right, let me relock this. I just knew he was going to do something. I'm just, you know, maybe it'll still, yeah. Well, we've, we've got a little ways to go, so we're going to head back downstairs. <laughs> Shh, Nikes. Um, sorry. Hi. How are we doing on, uh, I see it sounds like the camera was glitching a lot while we were in there, Ashley. Okay. Oh, was it? Yeah. All right. We are uh, back into the theater. Ooh. All right. Whew. Um, hey, Zoom guys, are you all still in there? Nope. <laughs> I might have lost them for real. Hang on. We're just checking in with our friends on Zoom. Oh, oh, oh. All right, we're gonna head downstairs and then I'm gonna rejoin them. All right, we are headed back down. If you've been at the Wells much, you're probably familiar with this stairwell. And we are going back to the lobby. It's, that was a lot. That really was a lot. I just knew that something was going to happen, but I, maybe he got a little shy. I don't know. It, it was definitely some energy. It really was. You felt it too, right? Oh, totally. Oh my God. It was like, <laughs> so we're headed back into the theater proper. Um, I'm not really sure what caused us to lose connections, oh, but, um, <laughs> well, it, it totally could have been our friend. Um, but I do know that I need to take just a second to rejoin our friends on Zoom so that we can hear a little bit more. Um, I see the good doctor. I see everybody back. Hey, how are you guys? I missed you. All right. I was scared all alone. Yeah. 
We aren't going in that costume shop. <laughs> all right. Um, Ryan, talk to us about the time you came in and all the the uh, the chairs were down. So there's a certain way they like to leave the theater every night, which is like all the curtains are drawn just to keep the heat and air um, and everything functioning and at its best, not overworked. Um, so every night I'd have the ushers put up all 650 some chairs, um, and you, they're like the old school kind. You have to physically move up and move down. Um, not like the movie theater ones that just do it on their own anymore. And then all the curtains are drawn. So every night, that's how I love the space. Light, like ghost light on stage, and that's it. And I came in several times, and the curtains would be, every one of them would be open in all three sets of the balconies, even the ones we don't use anymore. And a lot of the times, every seat in the whole house would be down. And what? A lot of work. It would take me closer to an hour to put everything back together again. So if it's a prank or if it's anybody like, just kind of having fun with me. That was kind of um, what they would do. And it wouldn't happen all the time, but every, one, every couple months, something would be different. I'd be like, and by the end, I just started talking to him. I was like, all right, guys. All right. Got me again. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, some people are talking and discussing the, uh, the fire that happened in the 60s, and I don't know a whole lot about that particular fire. Hi, Jay Reese. But... Um, uh, I do know um, that that there's some weird stuff that happens. He was referring to, can, you can see right here, these uh, curtains, um, which would be open, including the ones upstairs. Now, if you think about the fact that this theater was re renovated in 1986 and new, new tapestries and curtain frames were put in then, and while the tapestries have been cleaned since, they, um, the tracks of the curtains have not been changed. And it actually takes a decent amount of physical effort to open and close those. Um, but, uh, but that brings us to our next story because this particular box, if you're facing the theater, that would be on house right. And this box is where we often see the man in black, also known as the man in the tux or the man in the top hat. And uh, he was there, or he uh, sits there and has been seen, as have all three of these ghosts, I should be mentioned, I should mention, have also had appearances in the Monroe Building, which is on the other side over here of this wall, as well as behind us, uh, which is now the Tappet Building, and was originally, um, or at least when I first moved here, was A.J. Gators. That building is the Shulman Building. It's now uh, occupied by Governor School and some offices in Tappet. But when uh, when the when the theater was built, it was a different building completely, and that building had a Chinese restaurant on the roof, and you could actually pass back and forth between the theater, is my understanding, and the Chinese restaurant um, from from the second level. So. Uh, so there are stories about people who used to work at AJ Gators that would talk about, uh, both the child and the man in black and the woman in white, most commonly appearing in their storage room. If we look over at house left, um, you can see the, the faces and I'm going to get up closer on some of them. Um, just traveling a little here. Uh, all right. So you can see how these faces are all alike, except for one. Um, if you're facing the stage, the face we are looking at is the top left. And that face is different than the others. Um, if you go to stage right, our house right, you can see the boxes we were talking about earlier. And uh, that box where the man in black appears or the man in the tux, it is because his daughter is supposedly the face in the top left um, box and that she originally um, passed away during the building of the wells. And so that face uh, was made different than the other faces and he sits there so that he can gaze on her image and because she loved the theater and uh, he wanted to 
be able to celebrate her. And so we still see that. Now, I know that once I, uh, Ryan talked about, sorry for the jerkiness of the camera. Hang on. Here we go. Ryan talked about how uh, the curtains would close on their own. But I will say that uh, I was cleaning in that box one time. So I came here originally as an intern like 17 years ago and then went away and came back um, in a different title. But when I was here, uh, after, you know, two o'clock in the morning, cleaning up after a summer rental, I was vacuuming out that box and those curtains that are open right now closed all by themselves. And, um, that was pretty scary. And so I decided I was done vacuuming and I unplugged <laughs> and I went home and I came back in the light of day and cleaned up. Um, but that is a space. Do you feel anything from that box, Ashley? Um, when you were talking earlier, I was, I, I do feel a sort of, um, just a sadness. I don't feel him or anything, but I can, I can tell that, uh, that space holds, um, a, kind of a sadder energy, which would make sense if he's gazing on the face of his daughter that passed. Um, I just think he, um, and maybe, uh, also feels lonely. Uh, which is why he, again, is, is pretty present um, when people are in his, that's his space. He, um, I think, identifies that as his space so he could look upon his daughter. And so he uh, feels alone. And I think when people are up there, he, he wants to present himself uh, because he's lonely. So, um, but I don't, I don't see him or feel him or anything I can feel that energy though just off of this area um and it is it's 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 sad but it's very interesting you can see the distinct difference um, yeah it's in the face. it's a little hard to get on my camera um from this angle but that face is substantially different than all the rest it, it might be a lot rounder or wider um and just has a very different like that's as beautiful and ornate and specific as this theater is with frescoes on the ceiling, I have a hard time believing that that's an accident. Patrick. Yes, Ryan. Hang on one second. Uh, uh, questions about uh, the man in the top hat and, and um, if he's been identified. And I know it's, am I right? Sometimes we call the man in the top hat the architect, or maybe that's, that's separate. I, no, I, I, that is true. Um, so the story is that he was an architect who was working on the building with, uh, gosh, is it Hannity or Hanson and Sons? That was the original architect. And uh, this building was, was built, it was very progressive for its time, built out of poured concrete and steel and, um, and, and was advertised as being fireproof. So, you know, not, uh, not a small feat in its period. And we've got Bryce Kephart, who is uh, an old friend of Virginia Stage Company and was an intern with us some years ago um, on Facebook. And, and Bryce mentioning that he's had a scary incident with the man in black or the man in the tux. And if, if you don't mind, Bryce, I think I can recall well enough because I was there after Bryce had this experience um, he was in the main lobby and someone was walking into what is now uh, a kind of a coat closet, storage closet. At that time, it was a liquor closet. And he thought, oh, what, that's unusual. It shouldn't be in there. Um, and he walked up and there was no one in the space. I might be telling this a little wrong. Uh, Bryce, you can correct me on Facebook. But he realized later that that was a person that matched the description of the man in the tux or the man in black. And it seemed very odd to him that this person was so dressed up. And I remember when he had that realization, oh, Bryce was just white as a ghost. Yes, it was. It, it, Bryce says it was during rehearsal, probably during rehearsal of Christmas Carol, I'll bet. Thank you for that, Ryan. I, I remember Bryce talking about that a little bit at the time. Um, I will say a, a sweet part of this for me is how many familiar names I'm seeing pop up during this broadcast. And I, I wish I could hug so many of you that I haven't gotten to see in a long time. Um, 
uh, Jay Reese is saying that he had, uh, Jay worked with us as a uh, technical director for a while and also as an actor. And um, he's talking about having a lot of interactions with the woman in white while he was here, as well as, uh, as, well as with Ned. Um, the woman in white too, there are similar stories about her being up in this mezzanine and the technical director, I believe it was Robert Ashley, who was the ATD, um, when I first came, told a story about seeing her up there and, um, and asking her to leave. And he went to the lobby from which you should be able to see if someone's exiting. She never left. Um, the other doors were already locked and, um, and then she was gone. So now we get to uh, the Wells Theater stage again, and we're going to look up here. Uh, you can see this is the fly system above us. We have one of the few working uh, hemp houses left in the United States. Um, there are some, uh, there are uh, a few others that are partially, you know, kind of half hemp, and there are some many that have been converted, and there are some that are just not in use. When we say hemp, what we mean is, if you remember theaters, maybe like in your high school, that backstage they have a row uh, on the wall of ropes and, and you put stage weights in it. We don't have that. We have pins that are up there up top um, where you tie things off and hemp rope and sandbags. And so everything that's hung above our stage is hung independently um, from, and, and it's great because it's infinitely configurable. It's also a pain because you have to start from scratch every time and be very, very careful with safety concerns. So, uh, we're going to go up into the fly, um, where Ned hangs out. Um, and I'll tell you that story as we start up the stairs a little bit. Ned, um, <laughs> yes, Kelsey and, uh, Jay, we will, I will, find a way to mention how to appease Ned. Um, when I first came, uh, we talked about Ned a lot and used to leave him gifts. And it's a little harder to do one because nobody smokes anymore. And two, because uh, the passage to the roof is locked. Uh, we used to leave our friend Ned. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> we used to leave our friend Ned uh, 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 cigarettes um, and beer on the roof. But Ned was a sailor. Um, very common during this period to hire sailors to work in hemp houses for obvious reasons. And um, Ned, in particular, um, worked at this one. For a lot, uh, you know, sailors could communicate by whistle, which was handy for working backstage. And um, so Ned would uh, work backstage and operate ropes and flies. You can see some of our ropes as we head up. Um, and he, uh, the story is that one day he looks down the rail, and we'll get there in just a second and look down the rail. Um, I'm gonna go up one more step. Is he seen with like a like a cap? Yes, often. Uh huh. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, often. Okay, I just wanna make sure. <laughs> so, um, so the story is that Ned was uh, looking down uh, during an operetta, down a lady's dress, supposedly. Um, and he, uh, slipped and fell and got tangled up in the ropes. You can now see that we're up to the level of the electrics. You can see these lighting instruments right here. So this is how far up we are now. If you can see down there. Um, great. And you can also see these rooms that are off the galleries because back in the day, uh, the building was self-sufficient, so these were also dressing rooms. We're heading up the last st set of stairs. And now we're in the fly. You can see we take very good care of our ropes, and things are nice and well done and clean. Um, but Ned supposedly fell from this level. You can see where we tie off pens and where sandbags are used to um, counterweight. So all of these things go all the way up to the grid. Um, you can barely get me up there under normal circumstances, much less at night, so uh, I won't be doing that today. <laughs> but this is, uh, this is kind of where we credit Ned for hanging out. How do you feel? In fact, I can see exactly what he looks like. Um, 
He's kind of lanky, however, he has really strong arms. I feel like he used to do a lot on the ropes, which may, um, he was very risky with his behavior up here and people loved it. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it uh, brought him to his demise, but um, his energy is very uh, mischievous. And um, like I said, I feel like I, I feel like he was very like um, risky with almost like dangling, almost, uh, he wrapped his whole body in like his feet. He would grip with his feet on the ropes. Um, and so, but he, um, yeah, I see him with the cap. Um, and I feel like he, he likes to be known for his talents up here, which is why he presents himself the way he does to people. Yeah. I'm going to look over this edge again. I want to be very careful not to drop anything, but you can see Oof, it's quite a ways down. From the floor to the grid is actually six stories. Thank you, BA, um, which, is, uh, which is quite a, a height. There's uh, also an old window that's locked over here that you can see. And um, there was a there's a story. You can also see this ladder, right, which goes all the way up to the grid. Um, just for the record, all these places are usually locked off, but, um, up to the grid, there is, uh, you can walk across, it's kind of boingy, like a trampoline. Um, and, uh, and so the, the TD at the time had got the TD being technical director had gone up to check on things and he saw somebody walking around on this side and on the other side. And let's go ahead and walk over to the other side. But as he uh, looked down, he saw a guy who actually, actually, that's weird because it's very much the description that I've been given um, <laughs> oh, about him being clear. lanky, strong arms, all of that. And, uh, and the sandbags were, were swinging. And yeah, he, um, was, he was like a little acrobat on these ropes. Yeah, and so, uh, and so the guy was like, hey, you need to get out of here because, of course, nobody should be up here. It's very dangerous. Um, yeah, I can feel it too. Hey, Ned, buddy. What's up, dude? Hey, bud. Um, and so, yeah. Wow, I'm getting weepy again. You feel it? Yeah, totally. It's really intense on this side right now. Um, so, uh, so these bags would be swinging, you know, and these, these are very heavy sandbags, obviously, because they counterweight, um, lights like this and all sorts of stuff. Did you, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Did you hear a whistle? No. Somebody just whistled. Of course. I of course. Of course she did. Just heard a whistle. Huh. Um, so uh, I want to say too, Ned, that um, in this communication device that I'm broadcasting from, two different people have said thank you for helping them maintain up here, two different technical director folks, um, and, for, and for keeping things in order. Um, and that was from BA. I don't know if you remember her. Um, Jay said similar things. Um, so just know that, uh, that we're really proud to have you here. We've been talking about you for a long time, buddy. Um, He's proud to be here. Trust me. Bryce says he heard the whistle. He did? Yeah. Yeah. I heard it. It, it makes said, sense. It was like, like very quick. Um, so the technical director at the time with the story said that the window over here was locked and, you know, nobody, nobody came or went and, uh, and that was what he knew. You used to be able to get to the roof on, on there too. So, um, so this is a lot, uh, about, uh, the upstairs and Ned, um, we're going to go downstairs. One thing we haven't mentioned is, uh, during the sixties, you know, this was a theater, they showed movies for a while after that, and then eventually it became um, a porn theater, which probably Ned <laughs> didn't hate. Um, so, um, so during that time, uh, this stage, this area that we're on, this stage below, the proscenium arch, you know, the, the separation between the audience was, was boarded up. And so that was when um, this was actually a gin distillery as well as, I believe they call it a house of ill repute. And so, um, so you could, uh, you, the stage door, what's now the backstage door, of course, has always been the stage door. And at that time was the um, place that uh, was the front door of this place. I believe it was called the Jamaica Room. 
uh, uh, adult movies, very, very adult movies, Rob White. And um, in fact, I've met more than a few uh, older gentlemen in town who have talked about seeing their first um, skin flick here in the 60s and early 70s. Um, so we're going to go down to those rooms. And here we go. All right. And uh, check out. So these were originally dressing rooms. But also later became um, sex rooms for sex workers. Now it's lighting storage. There's one over here. I do feel like there's a, like a lady presence up here somewhere too. You were saying a lady presence? Yeah. Um, and I think it's separate from uh, the lady in white. I don't know. She's more. Um, she's just. She kind of has the same energy as like Ned. So I don't think they were, you know, um, knew each other or anything. But I feel like it's like a kind of a playful energy, which would align with what these rooms had going on. All right, we're going down to the next level and another row of of dressing rooms. Little fog machine in this room? No, I felt it back up there pretty strong with her. But I mean, this whole area is yeah a lot. <laughs> but I, I did feel um, the whatever that room was used for that we were just in. I felt like there was a presence there, a, a lady. Do you want to read that room? Oh my God, yeah, well, this is like, anytime there's a room with, and I get it because of the building. Yeah, um, talk a little louder. With all the, the power, um, they will manifest uh, from that. They literally use that energy to um, do the things that you guys are seeing them do around here. So that would make sense that um, there's, Ned's pretty active. And um, again, I felt that woman, it wasn't, um, too strong like Ned was I saw him immediately but um, the fact that there's an energy room up here literally um, is also kind of feeding the spirits so it makes sense that it's a lot going on and that the, the players see things up here um that that all lines up uh, Jenny was saying that Ned used to open the elevator for her. Jenny, our costume shop head, that uh, Ned would open the, the, the yeah, elevator like the door. <laughs> 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 Hello, sailor. All right. <laughs> um, so we're uh, just kind of cruising back through. We're going to head down. And um, I've, I've got Josh on the tour with us, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit about um, his favorite ghost in town, which, you know, who knows, might have attended the Wells at some point. Um, or actually, no, that's before the Wells, because it's the oldest house in town, right? Josh, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. All right, um, I'm uh, yeah. getting you pulled up. All right. Are you still here? Oh, we're repopulating. Here we go. <laughs> I think you're here. Hi. Uh, all right, you with me? Yes, sir. Um, so yeah, um, the, um, yeah, the Moses Myers house, uh, Moses Myers didn't attend the Wells theater. Um, uh, he died well before it was built, um, That's right. but, um, but the Myers family or the Myers household, uh, housed five generations of Myers family members, uh, and the last, um, uh, patriarch to, to live in the house, uh, whose name was Barton Myers, um, he didn't die until um, until uh, 1930. So um, it's very possible that he and his wife and maybe his daughters could have attended the Wells. Um, and uh, because you had five generations of people living and dying in the house, um, uh, we know that uh, Moses Myers and Eliza Myers, uh, his wife, both died in the house. We know that several of their adult children died in the house and that they uh, had several infant children that also died in the house. Um, which is where most people died at that time. It wasn't uncommon, but because you had that many generations die in that house, 
um, and it is now operated as a historic house and it's staffed with uh, people, um, you get a lot of stories uh, coming out of that, uh, of that house. Um, I used to work there um, and um, personally I didn't, um, I never experienced anything, but I always felt like there was uh, someone watching me. It was definitely one of those feelings there. Um, but the one story that I wanted to tell um, is um, it, it happened about 17 years ago, and it was uh, an employee uh, at the museum who had to go to the third floor, uh, which is where the ch children's rooms are. Uh, if anybody has uh, been to the museum, uh, to the Moses Myers house, um, on the third floor, um, you have uh, much smaller um, uh, rooms and much uh, lower ceilings, and that is where uh, all the children's bedrooms were. Um, and this employee had to go in there to um, either take some photographs or grab some photos out of one of the rooms uh, that at the time was being used as storage. Um, they walked in, they opened a door to one of the children's rooms, and they found a little girl with blonde curls in a red checkered dress sitting in a chair uh, on the third floor of the Moses Myers house by herself. Um, and he said that he looked at her and she looked at him, uh, and they both appeared a little shy <laughs> and like they had disturbed one another. Um, and he blinked his eyes and she was gone. Um, now, as you can probably guess, he promptly left the house <laughs> and, uh, um, vowed to never go back there alone. Um, and, uh, which you can understand why. Um, and there is documented, um, uh, evidence of a, a little girl being in that house in, um, a dress that was described by him. Um, so it very well could have been, uh, one of the, uh, descendants of the, of the Myers family. Um, as, uh, as, uh, when I worked there, there were a lot of people who, um, uh, said that they heard footsteps on the second floor when there was nobody else there. Uh, that they are doors shutting or doors being opened that they had closed themselves. Um, and um, so, uh, but I never felt, and I don't think anybody else has really ever felt anything um, predatory or, um, you know, malicious there. Um, I, so I, I would encourage people to, to visit the Moses Myers house. <laughs> yes. And we would encourage people to visit the Wells Theater, too. Thanks, Josh. That's, that's a crazy story. Um, I'm going to flip this around so you guys can see. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of stories. And we're going to head down to the place that probably freaks me out the most of this whole tour. Great. Uh, <laughs> um, which is uh, down to, uh, you can actually get there a few ways. Um, the trap door is actually right here in the center of the stage and I can open it right here and we can see down. Um, there you go. There you go. You can see down to the basement, but we're going to go down the stairs proper. Huh. Um, uh, somebody was asking, how do you make Ned happy? And um, if you have children, cover their ears. But uh, we have a long line of women who have worked here in technical director and company management positions that all say that um, if you show him your breasts, then he will uh, fix things. That makes a lot and, of sense. And um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of an old joke. Um, so we're going to go down these stairs. He was that, I think that whistle I heard was him whistling at a, at a lady. Maybe it was the lady I felt for the second one. I don't know. Maybe it was you. Maybe. Hey, maybe. It was totally you. All right, Ned. He's got some nice arms. Those I stairs mean, are really creepy. Yeah. That, that, um, yeah. So we are underneath the stage. Um, here are the... Ugh. You can smell it's really musty. Don't you, don't you get some energy down here? Yeah. Um, you can also see, if we come around, um, there's the... If you've ever watched Marley appear during a Christmas Carol, he comes up those stairs. Um, so we are coming around. There's uh, more storage that goes even deeper. 
And then, um, yes, Akeen, it goes deeper under the stage. And then this is actually where you would enter the orchestra pit. Um, oh. And um, and from here, you can see, like, the floor of the real? hills. What? What was what? Are they walking up there? Did you I don't think so. I asked them to stay in the lobby, but I would yell if something happened. So this is the orchestra pit, and um, you can see it's very shallow, but when the floor's up, um, it's about a th two or three foot. Uh, there are girls in the trap. Is that from the sex workers? I think that's what somebody's saying. Um, you think guys came? Well, no, it's only been done in the dark, I, is my understanding from the other folks who have done it. Um, ho, was that you? Just me. Okay. So... Um, so that's uh that's the downstairs. Okay. Um see we keep a lot of lights down here. Do you feel anything down here? It's again it's um it's definitely a staler energy. I don't feel like there's it's necessarily haunting, but um it is heavy down here. It is heavy. A lot of flooding has occurred here over the years. It's very heavy. Wait, what's that? What? I thought I heard that squeak again. Maris? No, I just heard that. I did too. Um, this is our friend Marley. All right, that's got to be like that's Carolyn or somebody. Person. That's that Carolyn. Hey, 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 hey. So Right? That's it's now you're person. here. Okay. Oof. Oh wow. So did you hear this? Okay. The earlier one that was not y'all. No. That really wasn't you. All right. No. Oh wow. So um, we're uh, wrapping up here with our tour. Um, any last comments from our friends uh, on Zoom? Oh, they've they've closed again. I need more hands, you guys. I do want to, um, we do have one little last story for you. Um, I think we lost them down there. All right. Ashley, do you have anything to close us out here? Uh, I really, this was a wonderful experience for me. Um, I genuinely uh, connected, I think, with, I wasn't expecting to connect. Uh, with the exception of this, I did feel the energy of the balcony, but... Um, I did pretty much connect with each uh, spirit, so that was that was pretty cool. I do want to say um, the collective energy from every single one of them is that they all love the theater, and how wonderful is that? Um, yeah, I, I I'm going to stop you right there before we finish this and say you know this ghost light is really important to us. Um, I mentioned that earlier, and. Uh, it's been fun to see so many familiar old friends pop up during this tour, but please know that, um, that as long as we can keep this light on, we're going to. And that whether you can literally come to the wells or whether the wells is an idea in your brains or your hearts or your whatever, um, what we say about public works is, um, is that theater belongs to all people and not just watching theater, but making it. And I hope that in whatever way you can, that you continue to create and to give and to do and to share stories like we've been doing tonight. And, um, and uh, we send you lots and lots of love in this time. And uh, be nice to yourself and be nice to your friends and, um, and, and just uh, think of us and we'll see you very soon. Ashley, do you want to um, give us a little, a little final good wish? time they're very hot which means they are working um, I just want to give a blessing to this ghost light this beautiful place that holds so much energy so much uh, history and I want to send light to everyone um, in this time and um, I'm sending light to the theater and all the spirits and uh, may they be human and or energies that come into this building so um blessed be 
Thank you, Maris and Carolyn, for hanging out with us. Thank you, panel, for hanging out with us, too, and for your good stories. And uh, we'll see you next time all at the Wells Theater. Um, there is a donate button, I think, and if not, you can go to vastage.org and check out all the great stuff we're doing uh, with vastage.org backslash virtual, um, where you can sign up for lots of classes and, and other interactive events like this. And we'll try to keep content coming. Um, keep us in your hearts. And uh, if you can spare a, a dollar here or there, these are tough times for all of us. But we're sending you our love and, uh, and wish you the best in this time. Thanks for joining us. See you soon.